It's our great pleasure today to host uh, Dr. Isi. Uh, currently, he has a dual appointment as an economic geologist in the Mexico, uh, New Mexico Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources, and as an assistant professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Studies at New Mexico Tech. Uh, he's the director of the uh, new or deposits and critical metals research group, as well as the labs in the pool. Uh, Alex got his master's in mineralogy and petrology from ETH uh, Zurich and a PhD in geochemistry from University of Iceland. In 2011, he moved to Canada and he did a postdoc at McGill University, uh, working on ore forming processes uh, I think uh, he did it with Anthony williams jones uh, Yes, it's a great honor to work with him. So his postdoc uh, was pretty intensive work, as I know, and he worked on world-class uh, strange lake where uh, zirconium and niobium deposit. And uh, obviously, I started designing new hydrothermal and some sorts of experimental studies for studying critical metals, uh, mostly uh, laboratory work as well as the thermodynamic database to stimulate the hydrothermal processes in that specific uh, mineralization system. From 2014 to 2020, he was an assistant professor uh, at Colorado School of Mines. Uh, and then he obviously moved to New Mexico Tech in summer 2020. So without further ado, Alex, please take it away. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm so excited to be here. It's, it's really nice to have this uh, online presentation. So thanks everyone for being here. And yes, today I will talk about rare earth elements. And as, as I'm told us, every, everything started in 2011 during my postdoc, uh, where China suddenly closed the market for rare earth, prices were rising, exploration was booming. And uh, I had the chance to, um, to witness live exploration of a rare earth mineral deposit, and then later do some uh, research on that. So to get started, what are the rare earth elements? I think they're, they're very exciting. They're chemically, they seem to be very similar, but they are still quite different. So the rare earth elements are a group of 17 elements with um, similar chemical properties. They include the lanthanides down here, plus scandium, plus yttrium. Um, they mostly occur as trivalent, so plus three state, except europium and cerium that can occur in different redox states. And in general, we subdivide them into the light rare earth elements, which we see on the left, uh, and the heavy rare earth elements that uh, we see on the right side. So the light rare earth elements are lighter and larger, the heavy rare earth elements are heavier and smaller. And what's also important for the economy is that the heavy rare earth elements are actually more rare and more expensive, so more, more difficult to find. And the subdivision of the light and heavy rare earth elements based on chemistry, uh, I just put it down there, uh, may be slightly different than what's based on uh, the industry. For example, in the industry, europium and gadolinium are also considered uh, heavy rare earth elements. And despite their names, the rares are not that rare. If you look in the crustal abundance, tens to hundreds of ppm, almost similar uh, concentration like copper, but they take their name because the rare earth element mineral deposit, the enrichment in rare earth minerals are not that common and actually rare. And if you look where the rare earth elements are used, as you may know, they have these uh, special properties due to the F orbital F electrons. So they have these magnetic and electronic properties that make our technologies fast, uh, stronger, lighter, and more efficient. And I put a couple of pictures. You can see here some cell phones, some lasers, hybrid cars, um, wind turbines. So they're used in the high technology and green technology, high tech and green technology industries to build permanent magnets, uh, energy efficient lights, batteries, etc., And they're considered critical minerals because uh, their resources are essential to the economy, for the future economy. And also the supply may be disrupted. So there is a renewed interest in uh, exploration and also producing and separating the rare earths in different countries, including North America. 
So here's a world map that show um, a couple of important rare earth mineral deposits in the world. And let's start with the blue dots. Uh, they are so-called carbonatites. I'm going to talk about them in the next slide. But in China, you will notice Bayanobo. Bayanobo is one of the major producers of rare earth elements. It's a giant deposit. And these carbonatites are mostly enriched in the light rare earth elements. And the mineral that is being mined in those is mostly called bastnezite, which is a light rare earth fluorocarbonate, which contains fluorine and CO2. If you move to the US, uh, to Mountain Pass in California, actually Mountain Pass was a major producer. Then China took over uh, and then Mountain Pass closed and reopened actually while I was professor at Colorado School of Mines. And now they are mining actively a rare earth elements there. And there's also uh, other projects like the Bear Lodge that was in an exploration stage when I arrived here in the US. And on the top here in red, what we can see are the alkaline or pralkaline igneous complexes or, or silicate complexes. And notab notably in Canada, we have Strange Lake, which I'm going to present today. That was an exploration stage. And we have the Nechalachu deposit. Um, that is a cyanide. And then uh, we also have Lovotsera in Russia and other type of deposits we find are, for example, in southeastern China, um, clay, iron clay adsorption deposits, so the rare earth adsorbed on clay uh, during weathering of rocks. Or in Australia, for example, Mount Weld, where we have a laterite, so a carbonate that has been weathered and enriched in the rare earth. And then some special uh, other type of deposits like Olympic Dam that are quite different. So just to briefly go over what's, what's a carbonatite. So you know it's an igneous rock. We find these dikes on the right side, an example from Lemita Mountain in New Mexico. It's pretty spectacular. We have these uh, carbonate-rich dikes. Um, and there are a lot of complex minerals. It's like a new language to learn about these different minerals. And in those carbonatites, we have some sodium, calcium, strontium uh, carbonates. But the key feature I like to highlight because the talk is about fluids, less uh, about the igneous processes. The igneous processes, yes, are important to enrich initially the rare earth in this uh, shallow crust. But there's a lot of alteration, even in carbonatites. We find phenitization, which is an alkali, sodium potassium, metasomatism. So, in the example on the right, you can see these gabbros surrounding the dike uh, have been completely phenitized. And there's also different types of alteration, carbonatization, chloritization, hematization, and silicification. So the fluids are important also in, in these deposits. There's a lot of alteration. If you look at alkaline and alkaline rocks, they look slightly different. Here are two examples, one from Strange Lake on the right side, and another one from the dialyte bearing late cyanide in Pajarito Mountain. And we can see they have some igneous cumulate textures with amphiboles, and often they contain uh, these exotic zirconosilicates and the amphibole are sodium rich and we can also find pyroxene that are sodium rich and we form these minerals instead of uh, feldspar because peralkaline means we have so much sodium potassium that it cannot be accommodated anymore into aluminium silicates and therefore we start to form those exotic amphibole and pyroxenes and we have a bunch of exotic rare earth minerals, rare earth phosphates, rare earth fluorocarbonates, rare earth silicates that we can find there. And again, alteration is important in these deposits. We also find our calimetasomatism and then uh, different types of alteration. I'm going to show you some examples later. But one key alteration we discovered and we think uh, uh, is very important in many of these deposits is a so-called calcium fluorine metasomatism. So in this presentation, I like to try to answer a couple of questions by showing you some evidence. And the question is, do hydrothermal fluids significantly affect rare earth distribution, the mineralogy and geochemistry in these mineral deposits? And if so, at what scales? And can we vector these uh, processes of, of hydrothermal rare earth enrichment? So I'm going to present two case studies. One from, the, from Strange Lake in Canada and the other one from Galinas Mountains here local in New Mexico. So let's start with Strange Lake. So yeah, in 2011, I had the chance to, to fly north. It's uh, located between Quebec and Labrador. It's a large mid proterozoic calcaline granitic rare zirconium niobium deposit. And it can be considered world-class even though it's not being mined nowadays. It's quite remote. That's, that's what makes it difficult. And it has a 
a large indicated resource, so it's considered a large deposit with 278 million ton that have been estimated uh, with drilling and exploration, etc. But the key is there's a pegmatite spine, so the, the pegmatites in this deposit are is in, forms a zone that is enriched in uh, rare earth elements, especially the more rare and expensive heavy rare earth elements. So now I'd like to show you a uh, geochemical, Burke rock geochemical map. Uh, it's a cross section through the deposit. And uh, I worked with the senior geologists there and they produced that for us. That was really awesome. And there's different drill holes. And what we can see in, in red or pink is the high concentration here on top, light rare earth element oxide, in the middle, heavy rare earth element oxide, and on the bottom, zirconium oxide. And what we can see right away is the, the red parts on the top, they are all flat lying pegmatite sheets and they're enriched in all these elements. But later, I'm going to show you that most of the rare earth minerals we find are everywhere in those peralkaline granites surrounding also those pegmatites, they're mostly hydrothermal textures. And uh, if you look at different zone in the granite, for example, here at the bottom, sometimes we are enriched in light rare earth, but depleted in heavy rare earth zirconium. And other zones are depleted in light rare earth, but actually enriched in heavy rare earth and zirconium. And actually there's a lot of mobilization of these elements during alteration that uh, depletes or enriches this element in different parts at the deposit scale, which is pretty impressive. So it's, I would say an extreme example of, of hydrothermal alteration associated to pralkaline uh, alkali complex, igneous complex. So here, just to show you a bunch, a uh, couple of rocks. So on top, I have a pralkaline granite on the left. And in black, we see this sodium iron amphibole called arfetsonite. And we can use that as an indicator in the field. We look at the color, we can distinguish different alteration types. So if I move down, uh, in the second uh, image here, in red, we can see we have some hematization. If I go further down, I can see in green, we have a so-called edgerinization. So I replaced the amphibole, the black amphibole, into edgerine, sodium iron pyroxene, which is actually a high temperature, early alteration type in Strange Lake. And then finally, at the bottom, this uh, purple, purple, blue, white colored rock was actually a granite, but it, it almost... Uh, doesn't look like that anymore. The textures have been completely overprinted. And this is what we call calcium fluorine metasomatism, which is a late stage alteration that also led to the enrichment of rare earth elements. And we find hydrothermal zircons. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to show you some evidence because this is not very common. It's pretty special. But first, let's go in the enriched pegmatites. And what you can see on the left hand side, most of them are pretty altered. And if you look at the bottom left image, uh, we can see there's actually no primary texture remaining. And all the, this is a high grade ore consisting only of gadolinite, the heavy rare earth element silicate. So all the high grade rare earths are generally found in hydrothermally overprinted pegmatites. And the idea is that we can kind of separate into two. So we have zircon and silicates, zircon that contains also the heavy rare earth elements. And then we have the light rare earth elements that are mainly contained in minerals like Bastnesite, which we already talked about. We find those also in mountain pass and in Bayanobo in carbonatites. And later I'm going to show you in Galinas mountains. And here a couple of micro textual relationships. So that's pretty exciting. What we can see here on the bottom, we see edgerine plus quartz. So this is an amphibole that has been altered at high temperature, early alteration. And then we have this later calcium fluorine metasomatism. So we see this big fluoride vein. And in the big fluoride vein, we have this little uh, zircon veinlet. And this is a backscattered image. And, and really to, to characterize that, because at the beginning, we didn't really believe that because zirconium should not be mobile, right? In hydrothermal fluids, but in these deposits, it can. So on the right side, you can see a, a couple of uh, element distribution map that shows that these veins are enriched in uh, zirconium and uh, silicon, and we also analyze them on electron microprobe. So we can mobilize zirconium and heavy rare earth elements in, during calcium fluorine metasomatism. And then here's another example where we find a relict. So it's a backscattered image of a bastnazite crystal that shows the solution textures. And if you look at the element maps, the, ma the main idea is that we have a fluid that interacts with that mineral, dissolves the light rare earth elements, transports them away, and then we can see that the bastnazite crystals are rimmed with this heavy rare earth, yttrium, 
uh, and gadolinium. So we have a precipitation of heavy rare earth elements. So we are believe we are separating fractionating light rare earth and heavy rare earth elements, which normally should not happen, right? They are chemically very similar, but actually they're not. They have some differences. And now to move to the next. So looking at all this field observation, microtextual relationships in 2013, we actually published a paper where we combined all this observation with thermodynamic modeling. And I'm going to come back a little bit to thermodynamic modeling later. But just to summarize briefly, what, what we managed to do is to simulate a high temperature fluid rock interaction in those pegmatites to simulate the pH of these fluids, the alteration minology, and also the, the ore minerals. And then also at lower temperature, we can again measure, uh, calculate the pH as a function of fluid rock interaction and the stability of the minerals. And the, the key message from that model was that at high temperature, we are capable of um, dissolving basnezide and mobilizing light rare earth elements, whereas the zircon only becomes unstable at lower temperature. And that's when we can mobilize zirconium, which kind of works with what you observe in the field. And then combining the field observation and thermodynamic model, we kind of were able to develop this conceptual model, which is kind of guiding us to interpret the bulk crop geochemistry in the field, the lithogeochemical vectors. So the basic idea in Strange Lake is that we uh, emplace the granite, we form the pegmatites, and at some point we exhaust some hydrothermal fluids. So we have a kind of automatosomatism, a high temperature edgerinization alteration, and then later in the late stage, we, the system opens up and we start to form veins and we have this pervasive calcium fluid metasomatism. So if you look uh, at the bulk rock geochemistry, we looked at different lithogeochemical vector and the idea is on the x-axis, we used calcium over aluminum as an indicator of calcium fluid metasomatism. And the key message is just to show you that the light rare earth elements are not changing so much with calcium fluid metasomatism. But in contrast, if you look at heavy rare earth and zirconium, we can see there's a very high enrichment in the pegmatites and granites with calcium fluorine metasomatism. Therefore, it looks like that this alteration type is key for rare earth mineralization in this type of deposit. So now let's move on to another system. Let's move here local to New Mexico and show some difference or similarities or other things we can find. So here at the New Mexico Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources, we investigate the potential for critical mineral resources uh, in the state. And particularly, I'd like to highlight Dr. Vincenia McLemore, who's a senior economic geologist, who has worked many, many years on describing all these different rare earth deposits. Um, and currently, there's also a collaboration called the Earth Mapping Resource Initiative with the US Geological Survey and the Geologic Survey. Uh, where they, we are mapping some of these rare earth deposits and sampling them and doing some geochemistry. And in New Mexico, the idea is we have different types of deposits, but they're mostly alkaline igneous complexes. And some of them, like Galinas Mountains, you can see in the middle of the state, are hydrothermal fluoride pressure vein deposits. And we also have carbon attacks. So here are a couple of field pictures. On the right side, my master student, Evan Owen, who is currently working on the Galinas Mountains. This deposit is hosted in sandstones and limestones and mostly consists of trachytic to cyanitic dikes, intrusives and volcanic pressures. And we find uh, a lot of hydrothermal fluoride veining and brecciation. And if you have a closer look at these veins, here's some hand sample. They mostly consist of, of uh, barite calcite fluoride veins. And the main ore mineral uh, that we find is the rare fluorocarbonate bastnazite, like in Bayanovo. And here are a couple of thin section photomicrographs in cross polarizer, and we can see that we always find this assemblage barite, fluoride, calcite, or barite fluoride. And we also can find this beautiful, amazing, huge bastnazite crystal integral again with calcite and fluoride. If you look at the bulk crop geochemical data based on this database compiled by Virginia McLemore from the Earth MRI USGS NM and New Mexico Tech project, what we can see here is the total rare earth elements in the bulk rocks. So they've measured, sampled everywhere in Galinas, mountains, veins, and pressure. And on the x-axis, we can see barium, and the colors here show the fluorine concentration. And the key message is we can see 
If we go from the left to the right, we increase barium. Of course, we have more of those barite veins. We increase the total rare earth elements in this rock quite significantly. And we also increase the amount of fluorine. We have more fluoride. This indicates, similar to Strange Lake, that we have a fluorine metazematism that controls rare earth deposition in this deposit. So here are a couple of uh, automated mineralogy maps on the left side that show in orange these large uh, barite crystals. And then we, in purple, we can see fluoride. So on the left side, we also have calcite. On the right side, it's, it's packed, it's full with hydrothermal veins of fluoride and also quartz. And what we can also see is that it's really complex. So complex cross-cutting relationships. But I like to highlight two things here. The first one, as you can see in this automated mineral G map, these very large uh, fluoride crystals. And then we see a matrix filled with very fine grained purple fluoride. And in green, we can see the uh, bastensite. So we have an integral of mineralized rare earth and fluorocarbonates. And we have therefore these different types of fluoride generation and pulses of fluids. So the main hypothesis, what we think is going on, is that we have a hydrothermal fluid that transports rare earth and fluorine and probably other things like chloride. And then we have a rock that contains some carbonate, perhaps some carbonate veins. And when we dissolve these carbonate veins, we release calcium and CO2. And if we mix everything together, what we can form is calcium fluoride, fluoride and rare earth fluorocarbonates, bastensite. So it, seem, it seems to work, but this is just a hypothesis right now. We also did some cathode luminescence. So I'm going to show you very, very recent example. Actually, some even we just got them this week. So it's very exciting news. And what we can see is there's a lot of different types of fluoride cross-cutting relationship. There's veining, there's dissolution textures, and zoning. And then what we did, we did some uh, laser ablation ICPMS. So we measured the rare earth elements. Uh, here's just an example. You can see the squared craters from quartz to rim in a fluoride crystal and at the bottom, lanthanum concentration. And we, we, in general, the zoning may affect slightly the rare earth concentration, but we've just found a new zone. It's very exciting with extremely high rare earth concentration, 3,000 to 5,000 ppm rare earth. And we even found fluoride with higher rare earths. And we don't know yet if it's integral with some basmazite or not, but it's, it's important. So the question is, what's the implication for mineralization in that deposit? And this is something we'll answer hopefully in the future, or we can talk about it at the end of the presentation. Then if you look at the laser ablation data here on the left side, so we see the chondrite normalized fluoride com composition of rare earth. And I put here three different colors to show that we have a lot of different textures and we have a different chemistry and we have a lot of variation in the light rare earth elements and also the heavy rare earth elements. And normally what we would expect is that the light rare earth elements like lanthanum and cerium has a closer ionic radii to calcium two plus we find in fluoride. So fluoride should be enriched in light rare earths, but not all of them are. So despite the simi similar chemical properties of the rare earth, there's a clear fractionation. So what controls this? So just to give you a brief overview from what we know and where we are going, so we, we know that for, if you look from the minerals perspective, well, the, the rare earth mobility depends on the solubility of rare earth minerals. And this includes rare earth phosphates like monazite, but also fluoride or carbonates like calcite or apatite. They can also contain significant amount of rare earth, especially apatite. And then we need to better understand the substitution mechanism in the mineral gene, the crystallographic sites. And if you look from the aqueous fluids perspective, the question is, what type of fluids are altering those rocks and transporting the rare earth? Are they alkaline? Are they acidic? And we also need to better understand the speciation. So the rare earth elements in the fluid can speciate with ligands and be transported in these fluids. But what ligands are important in which deposit? So I funded the ore deposits and critical minerals uh, experimental lab here at New Mexico Tech since 2020. And we already started this in 2014 at Colorado School of Mines and extended here. We have a pretty large group of several postdocs, graduate PhD, master students, and even undergraduate students who do research. It's very exciting. To date, we got uh, significant funding uh, to do. We actually only do research right now on rare earth elements. So it's pretty exciting. And it's funded by the National Science Foundation, the US Department of Energy. 
And I'm going to show you now a couple of examples of what type of experiments we, we do in our lab currently. Uh, but also, I'd like to briefly mention that we just got a US Geoscience, uh, actually a grant from the DOE, Critical Minerals Grant, to form a new US Geoscience Critical Minerals Research Hub between New Mexico Tech, Los Alamos National Lab, and Indiana University, which will enable us to do experiments at high temperature in supercritical fluids. Right now, we only go to 350 and we will be able to go much higher temperature. And we also, as we speak, building a new Raman facility and we are going to get the hydrothermal diamond and mill cell. So what are we doing now in the lab and actually building up because two years is a short time. It takes a lot of work to build all this. So what we started with is we want to measure the speciation of rare earths. So what we do, we use different spectroscopic techniques. And right now we use UVV spectrophotometry. You can see how this absorbance looks like. But essentially what we're trying to do is we are trying to determine in high temperature hydrothermal fluids, which ligands are responsible for the transport of rare earth elements as a function of pH and temperature. And on the left side, you can see a model of uh, what we currently know. So currently we know in acidic fluids, most likely chloride, may be very important to transport rare earth elements. We could also form fluoride complex. People have measured those in the past. But in alkaline fluids, the rare earth hydroxyl complex, this is all theoretical. We have no experimental data at all, and we are measuring them as we speak. The second type of experiment is we also do solution calorimetry and mineral solubility experiments. Uh, so you can see a, a couple of pictures of the calorimeter on the left. And on the right, a couple of synthetic rare earth phosphates made in the lab, and then we measure their solubilities. And why do we do this? It's to determine their thermodynamic properties, Gibbs energy, equilibrium constant, et cetera, to know when they are stable or not. And then the third type of experiments we're currently doing, and this is funded through my NSF career uh, grant, we actually determine partition coefficients between rare earth elements and minerals. So we synthesize hydrothermally at high temperature, uh, calcite, fluoride and also appetite and then what you can see we have these hydrothermal reactors and then in the middle you can see a synthesized calcite crystal doped with rare earth elements so at the end of the experiments we can measure the rare earth in the fluids and in the minerals and build our new molds so talking about molds we are developing here a database called the mines thermodynamic database so we make everything available uh, for free open access we also uh, have a tutorials how to do geochemical modeling and use our database and we offer workshops and the idea is that this database consists of rock forming minerals to simulate actually we focus on all forming processes and not only rare earth but also base and precious metals and, and other things like that so pretty exciting things going on there and finally I just like to show you one type of experiment to kind of deep dive a little bit to show you what we do and show you some results, not only what we are doing. So what we do is simulate in the lab how temperature and pH, acidic and alkaline fluids and salinity affects the solubility of fluoride because we talked about it in Galinas Mountains, fluorine metasomatism is important. So how does it work and how does it affect wear of mobility? So we do this hydrothermal batch type experiments. You can see here on the right side. We basically load the reactor with a hydrothermal fluid, uh, fluid sorry, water at, high te uh, at room temperature with different initial pH. So we have acidic, pH 2, 4, and alkaline, pH 10. And we add the fluoride crystal in there. And in some experiments, we also added salt, NaCl, or we doped with rare earths. And then we close the reactor, we heat it up in a furnace and equilibrate it for two weeks. And at the end, we quench the fluids, we extract the fluids and the crystal, we separate them and measure the composition. So, so here are some results. On the left side, we can see the fluid chemistry. On the top, we can see the log molality of calcium versus time. So these are kinetic experiments to see if we approach equilibrium. And the first thing I like to uh, point is at pH of two, as you may think already, well, yes, acidic. So we have a lot of fluoride dissolution. Then if I increase my pH to pH of four, this green line, you can see that the solubility is much, much lower. And then in the bottom diagram is an example of an alkaline fluid reacted with fluoride. The solubilities are even lower than a pH 4. So what we also observed is when we drop in some NaCl, we increase dramatically the solubility even in alkaline fluids. And that was so surprising. You can see these blue dots after 14 days of reaction. 
if you add some NaCl in the experiments, we can dissolve much more uh, fluoride. On the right side, also a couple uh, of SAM textures. And I'd like to highlight that my student, master student, Madison Payne, has actually been conducted, uh, conducting all these experiments and um, taking a lot of this picture in detail, all the different alteration textures. So, so it's quite exceptional um, experimental results we observe here. And finally, I'd just like to show you something about the rare earth elements, because that's where I'm interested. So if we dissolve fluoride, the question is, what's happening with the rare earth? Normally, people think that if you have rare earth and fluorine, it's not going to be able to stay in the fluid because it forms insoluble rare earth fluorides. Well, here in our experiments, we see here the rare earth elements in the fluid normalized to chondrite. And we did experiments salt-free and with salt. So we can see in the salt-free experiments that teach to we can dissolve significant amount of fluoride and also significant amount of rare earth. Whereas in alkaline fluids, we have much less fluoride dissolution, much less rare earth in the fluid. But the key message is drop some salt in there and then we increase the rare earth mobility and solubility by orders of magnitude. So that's pretty exciting. So to what are the implications of all these experiments? So it's possible to transport rare earth elements in acidic, but perhaps also in alkaline fluids, despite the low solubility of rare earth fluorides, the key ingredient is NaCl. The rare earth element released from fluoride is, is in general not sufficient, at least in the experiments, for saturating the fluids with secondary rare earth minerals. We need to dope them with rare earth, and then we form some rare earth fluorides actually in the experiments. And finally, in nature, we find rare earth fluorocarbonates, and we observe them to control rare earth mobility but their formation depends probably on additional rare source of fluid rock interaction process. So talking about fluid rock interaction process, that's the last part of the talk, very brief. We can actually simulate fluid rock interaction and, and use this, what I call holistic approach to try to understand what's going on in the field. So we're trying to link experiments and field observation. And here in the example, you can see on the right side, the field observation, so we have carbonate veins and they're replaced by fluoride and bastensite. So we try to simulate that. And on the left side, that's the concept. Very simple, we have a box, we fill it with calcite and we could fill it also with barite. And then at each step, I flush in an acidic fluid that contains um, fluorine, HCl and rare earth with chondritic values to check what's going on. So we flush the fluid in, out, in, out, and so on and so on. And then we can see here the pH evolution in that box. So upon increased fluid rock interaction, of course, the, the pH is initially buffered by calcite carbonate until it's entirely dissolved. On the right side, you can see the stable mineralogy that is decreasing with increased fluid rock interaction, and then the pH drops. And what we can also see is when we put in fluorine, we dissolve calc calcite, we can form both fluoride and bastazite. Okay. So it looks like a very simple model, uh, nothing fancy, but actually I would say, yeah, there's something fancy here. You notice the fluoride rare earth. And what we did is we actually simulated how does the rare earth composition of that fluoride change upon fluid rock interaction, which to my knowledge, no one can do that. So here are our first results and we haven't published this yet, but I still like to show it to you. The left side, again, the natural fluoride composition from Galinas Mountains. And on the right side, you can see the rare earth element composition, Conrad normalized, of the simulated fluoride. And of course, this is a little bit artificial, but uh, an interesting thing is we have an enrichment factor during precipitation of fluoride of 100 times. And the enrichment is very similar to enrichments we find in the natural fluoride. We can also see that fluid rock interaction and pH is actually controlling the, some of the rare earth variation that we observe in the natural system, mostly the heavy rare earths. And finally, we have a competition between fluoride and bastensite. Bastensite takes most of the light rare earth elements when it forms initially. That's why we have some patterns that may be depleted in the light rare earth elements. So to conclude, we have uh, this interplay. If you look, uh, Strange Lake, Galinas Mountains, experiments, and, and bring everything together. We have this interplay between magmatic and hydrothermal processes in critical mineral deposits. And now we can start simulating the varying rare earth composition, uh, even in those gang minerals in, in this fluoride, we find they're ubiquitous in natural systems. 
but we are still lacking a lot of experimental data. That's why we are doing all this work for many of the rare earth minerals and also partition coefficients. So more, and also most of the aqueous complexes we model, we know them most at acidic condition and low temperature. And now we are also in, uh, increasing our knowledge in alkaline fluids and also in high temperature acidic and alkaline fluids. And to, to finish up, uh, I'd like to thank the funding agencies, uh, all the grants we got to do that research, NSF career, NSF grant, the Department of Energy, US Department of Energy, Basic Energy Science, SEG uh, also funded some work on Galinas Mountains for the student grants that's so valuable for the master students. I'd like to thank my collaborators, graduate students, postdocs, and you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Alex, for that fantastic talk. That was very insightful. I thoroughly enjoyed that, and I'm sure I'm speaking for everyone else here. So uh, right away, I think we'll start off the discussion then, and uh, I'm going to jump straight in with my question. Uh, I noticed that when you had the graph up earlier of the different sort of ligands which these rare earth elements can be transported as, you have chloride complexes, but you don't have any sulfide complexes. Is there a reason for that? Because most other sort of economic metals are transported as sulfide complexes. Why yeah. doesn't this really happen with the rare earth elements? That, that's a good question. So we actually can form, people have measured uh, not bisulfide, you know, like gold forms bisulfide complex to transport in neutral solution, but the rare earth complex with sulfate. And that's interesting, right? Because we find barite, which is a sulfate. So there's sulfate in some of these fluids. Some are more oxidized. Uh, initially, they may also be more reduced where we have uh, sulfide or bisulfide. Like we find also pyrite that's been oxidized later. And the main reason why it's not shown is because we haven't added it yet to the thermodynamic database. But I have a PhD student right now uh, working on it to add it to our models because we started working on galinas uh, in the past two years. And then we, we realized, well, in Strange Lake, sulfur was not that important, but in Galinas Mountains, it is. And also, you know, Galinas Mountain is actually not considered a carbonatite. But if you look at carbonatites in China, for example, and even not past, we find hydrothermal fluoride, mm -hmm. sulfide, sulfate veins, diera, barite, fluoride, calcite, and bastnezite. So perhaps there's also a carbonatite in Galinas, but we don't know. But what I think is, yes, sulfur, sulfate may be important, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps in acidic solution. Perhaps we have also new ligands we have not discovered yet. There's actually a new paper that just came out, also talked about carbonate complex. Um, mixed carbonate, fluoride, carbonate hydroxyl. Uh, so there's still a lot to discover. We thought we, we know a lot or everything, but it's not, we, we don't know everything. <laughs> and I also, no, I also noticed that at the last uh, SCG conference, there was some presentation and, and people have discussed the history of science in economic geology. And someone highlighted that, yeah, thermodynamics was done in the 70s, 60s, 70s, <laughs> 80s. And then we moved on to geochronology and other things. And now the machine learning and but I'm saying that if you work on rare elements, you're just beginning the, the thermodynamic the experiments. Uh, but the field work is also very important. And, and I also want to highlight, you know, I, I think it's important to do geochronology and, and all these other parts I've not shown also in my talk for sure. Fantastic. Thank you. That's particularly interesting with the sulfate, because that does sort of uh, possibly suggest some sort of oxidized alkalic fluids. Um, you actually mentioned sort of China earlier as well. Uh, do you think that uh, because China just completely dominates the market with rare earth elements at the moment, do you think that there is scope to, in the USA in particular, perhaps to uh, increase uh, production in the upcoming years? I mean, that's political speculation business. I don't know how much <laughs> I want to involve, but, but what I can observe <laughs> is that there's a lot of funding right now uh, to understand critical minerals from a lot of different fronts, mm -hmm. uh, including basic, uh, basic research, fundamental research from the geo survey, from the US geological surveys, also for mapping or, or doing for, you know, more characterization, geology characterization to know where they are. And so we have a lot of, you know, outcrops on the surface, perhaps a couple of drills here and there, but we haven't drilled all the places. And I think one of the major problems still is the separation of the rare earth elements um, because it's not easy to separate them. And the key argument sometimes is also that it's not that environmentally friendly, depending on the way 
uh, we, people try to, to separate them. So I guess we need to increase the expertise also in other places. Right now, the expertise, to my knowledge, is mostly in China. That's why in Europe and Australia and, and other places, North America, we want to increase that, that knowledge. Um, and I think it, it's important to increase that knowledge, also have the workforce. If there's an increase in future demand, which is actually already happening, that uh, people are available to, to, to enable this. So, but that's the key question. When I moved to the US, all the companies that did exploration in Canada, most of them went bankrupt. And then five, six years later, it's a boom again. So it's, it's going up and down and we cannot, it's difficult to predict. So it's exciting uh, metals to study, but it's not, uh, you know, yet like stable or only uh, increasing like that. So that's the main thing is the price to extract and mine is quite high. So it's difficult to make this rare element deposit, even though we know they are here to make them economic and viable at present. But I think we need to think longer scale. We need to think not five years, not 10 years, but perhaps 25 to 50 years uh, ahead. So in the future maybe then <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, oh i'm just going to pass you over to a member of our audience alex uh I mean, holly if you'd like to unmute yourself and then uh sort of ask your question please hi alex a uh, great talk thank you um i actually work on the phenite surrounding carbonatite so i found it fascinating um your talk about the different um mobilities in the fluid. So I, I really just wanted to um, clarify on one of the uh, things that you started to say. So you were talking about your um, about your theoretical data and you started to say that chlorine transports rare earth in acidic fluids and you started to say what they uh, what transported them within alkaline fluids, but then you started saying something else. So I just wanted to clarify firstly what you think is transporting them within the alkaline fluids as opposed to the acidic ones. Yes. So from what we currently know from low temperature experiments, so low temperature, I'm talking between 100 and 350 degrees Celsius. So uh, I mean, you know that this magmatic hydrotone system can also be between four and 600 degrees, so higher temperature. We know that the acidic condition, uh, if we have a lot of chloride, chloride will dominate the speciation of rare earth so they can mobilize the rare earth. And most of these magmatic hydrotone fluids contain chlorine. Um, if we have fluoride, we may also transport and complex the rare earths, but the main problem is that we, if we increase a little bit the pH, we drop them out because of the insoluble rare earth fluorides. And then it depends what we have in our fluids. Right now, um, if we just look at pH and we just add hydroxide to our fluid, we will have a, the possibility to form rare earth hydroxyl complex, which is rare earth OH complexes. Um, but we don't have experimental data right now at higher temperature to support exactly how much. So we don't, we don't know. There's very few experiments. And then the second thing is very recently, I mean, we already had the hypothesis in our minds for a couple of years, but very recently, there are new high temperature uh, molecular moles and some people who do um, experiments on the synchrotron with this diamond annual cell that we are trying to also get here to be able to look into this high temperature fluid that perhaps there are new species we have not discovered yet. And uh, one paper that just came out, I think it's from Marion Lubel uh, and the research group, a colleague in, in Germany, uh, some carbonate, I think it's a mixed carbonate fluoride possible complexes or perhaps OH mixed with fluorine and others have suggested sulfate mixed with OH. So there, there, there are some new hypotheses emerging and we don't know yet. So that's like, um frontier of science <laughs> that's what I okay, thanks say. Alex the second question I had was um when you were talking about this calcium fluorine metasomatism um you were talking about the earlier stages in relation to strange lake being um autometasomatism so essentially it's the fluids dissolving from the the actual pegmatites but what do you think might be the source of this fluorine rich fluid that's um causing all of this mobilization after so just from the field observation, the, the fluorine itself is clearly coming from the pegmatites. And it's kind of difficult to imagine how this works. 
So, so we, we probably need to better understand when we have the intrusion, not everything is solidified and, and we still have some melts and some um, different magmatic processes that can happen like melt emissibility. So there's a lot of more complicated stories to the whole story I have not uh, had time to present. And my colleagues in Canada, uh, like uh, Olga Vazukova is, uh, has published a couple of papers about this melt emissibility processes. And what we've just seen just by studying at the rocks and block geochemistry back when I was working there was that all the fluorine con is concentrated within the pegmatites and the texture suggests that when we crystallize the pegmatite from the border to the core, we uh, form initially perka and granitic pegmatites. And in the core, everything is enriched in, um, in uh, quartz and fluoride. And then we form veins that actually come out of the pegmatites into the granite. And the veins have alteration halos into the, into the granites. So I would say the evidence suggests that most of the fluorine rich fluids come out from those pegmatites. So, so that's, it's just that's... several different stages of exolution. Thank you very oh. much. Yes, and thank you so much for your very interesting questions. Okay, Alex, uh, the next question is from Yuri that I'm going to read over. Is the pH for the fluid indicated uh, in situ or at the room temperature? And the next part of the question is, how does the pH changes before and after your experimental runs? In, uh, with the fluoride. Yeah, the fluoride, we, we just indicated the, uh, the pH at room temperature because it's kind of, we're trying to figure out what's the most easy way to pass on the science to other people. <laughs> so, you know, we prepare the fluids at room temperature, pH of two, and then when we heat up, of course, first of all, the pH would just change because the dissociation uh, of acid changes, uh, the, the water properties change with temperature. So pH changes with temperature. So room temperature, pH seven is neutral. It doesn't mean that at 400 degrees, the neutral pH will be seven. That's the first uh, thing. And the second one is, yes, we, we actually change slightly the pH when we react those fluids, when we start to dissolve uh, fluoride. And uh, based on the water chemistry, so we measure all the major elements, we can calculate what's the pH at temperature at equilibrium with the fluoride. And we can also double check if we are at equilibrium with fluoride by measuring calcium and fluoride and look if we are saturated with, with that mineral. And the pH is, is changing slightly. I forgot the exact numbers. My master student may know better, but I would say instead of two, it's changing probably to three or four, something like that, high temperature. But I, I don't recall on top of my head, so sorry for that. Okay, that's good. Uh, Susanna, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, hi. Um, I was wondering if you found any appetite associated with the, the rarest element in, in minerals in, in Strange Lake or uh, the other places. Because I just started working on the Fox Harbor volcanic belt, which is similar to Strange Lake. Yeah. And every time I see light layer elements like alunite, is is there is a lot a lot of appetite associated with it. So, yes, the interesting thing I haven't mentioned when I was in well, actually in Strange Lake, I didn't find much appetite. Not much phosphorus, not much sulfur. So it's slightly different. A lot of fluorocarbonates, but we took once the helicopter with the CEO of Quest Rare Minerals and Billy. And we flew down to another place that we're exploring. Uh, I think it was like two hours away from Strange Lake called Misery Lake. And they have some more primitive, uh, because Strange Lake is a palkaline granite. It's quite evolved and we also have pegmatite. So evolved palkaline uh, granitic intrusion. But then we went to Misery Lake and there we find, I would say a little bit more primitive, uh, probably closer to metal signatures, cyanides, uh, layered cyanides. And some of them had some gabbros, and they were actually packed with apatite and brittolite uh, and things like that. So in the case of Strange Lake and surroundings, it's, it seems weird. It seems that the, the very evolved Palkan intrusive had less uh, apatite than you know, a more primitive cyanic type of intrusion, which doesn't mean there isn't any. There's a lot of things in there, a lot of exotic uh, minerals 
that we find locally, but like on a large scale, I've not seen that. And then, yeah, and we are interested also in appetite because we want to try to do some experimental work uh, with those minerals as well. Um, but right now, I don't really have uh, much natural analogs. I've worked personally with appetite, but that, that's something exciting. So I'm, you know, reading the papers and if anyone has some inputs, feel free to, to contact or email um, or talk with me at the conference. I'm very excited also about appetite. Okay, thanks. I have another question. Um, I was wondering if you, uh, it's strange, like like uh, the paraclin, you know, it's it, granite, it's kind of, it doesn't have that much calcium in it. So I was wondering what the idea is that where is the calcium coming from the, for the calcium metasomatism? Yeah, that's, that's the strange thing. So where is the magic calcium coming from? And initially, the, the, the idea was based on fluid inclusion data that they see low temperature fluid, external magic fluid comes in. And, but it's possible, you know, so metroic water, something that uh, contains calcium low temperature and mixes with the magmatic fluids. I, I would have to read more about the, the newest studies, but if you look at those melt emissibility, to me, it shows that there must be initial magmatic calcium and fluorine, it's just separated from the silicate melt and enriched like in those pegmatite pockets spe in specific zones and, and how it's controlled, where exactly they occur, that's a bit more difficult to answer from my side. But often it's these two theories. One is an external fluid that brings in the calcium um, because normally magmatic fluids don't exhaust, I think, very calcium rich fluids, they're more potassium sodium rich. So but that's an excellent uh, thought or question for sure. Thanks. So Alex, uh, I have a question from a member of the audience who said that uh, you mentioned the importance of sodium chloride for the solubility of rare earth elements and niobium. Although rare earth elements and niobium behave differently uh, in terms of their solubility. Do you think that the evolution of sodium chloride concentration in fluids still plays an important role of the precipitation of niobium rich minerals such as pyrochlor or iron rich columbite? Oh, yeah, niobium. I haven't really talked much about niobium. I mentioned Strange Lake contains niobium, and there's a lot of pyrochlor in Strange, in Strange Lake rocks, uh, in addition to a, a zircon. So, you know, if you think about high field strength elements, niobium, tantalum, zirconium, you know, do they behave very similar or different? That's the big question. And I know that there were a couple of um, more recent studies from the Williams Jones group and, and a couple of postdocs and, and master, uh, PhD students who measured niobium solubility with fluorine. So I think that the idea is that niobium can complex with fluorine. From my knowledge, from my, our models, we actually managed to dissolve um, zircon, hydrothermal form or dissolve hydrothermal zircon by complexing zirconium with fluorine and uh, OH. So they People have done experiments and they measured hydroxyl fluoride complex to make things even more complicated. So it looks like the problem, I think, I hypothesize that niobium may behave similarly, but zirconium, if you drop in some fluorine, we can dissolve it. And in the model, it dissolves at lower temperature because it has a retrograde solubility, which is strange, right? But it's like carbonates, calcite also dissolves more at lower temperature than a tight temperature. So I would say these are the two competing processes, but I'm not such a big, uh, I'm not that knowledgeable about niobium yet. I haven't worked that much with that element. Yeah, I mean, thank you for that, Alex. Uh, we have a question from another member of the audience. Uh, Justin, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, Alex. First, great talk. Thank you for uh, sharing all the work that you and your, your group are doing. I'm, I've been following some of your work with uh, a lot of interest. Um, you mentioned uh, that you were interested in looking at rare earth element uh, sulfate complexes. Uh, is this going to be a, a continuation or a, a refinement of the, the previous work that was done by Artos? Um, and if so, do you have a, a potential, I guess, uh, temperature limit for any modeling that comes out of that? Yeah, so right right now we're just uh, at this, actually we have this uh, ongoing DOE project. So I have uh, a postdoc and this also collaboration with Chen Tzu at Indiana University and my colleagues 
at the Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland, Dan Miro and Dimitri Kulik, who actually developed the geochemical modeling software GEMS. And we are trying right now to incorporate all the available experimental data we have and do thermodynamic optimization and cross-check with available experimental data. And I would say the plus we try to do is actually also simulate some of the natural systems to try to see if when we apply those experimental data actually it works or if there are problems. And the, the idea is actually started collaborating also with Los Alamos National Laboratory and ATAS. Mikdisov is also working there. So we are starting a new collaboration. We started it last fall. So finally, uh, we'll do some experimental work together and we, we will tackle. So we start now with chloride and, and probably we'll also tackle some sulfate at higher temperature. So, so this, this is all on the table. And we, we are developing, as we speak, a lot of new high temperature experimental technique to measure these species. Because what we know from, uh, if you look at all the available work at low temperature, which are mostly solubility experiments in closed reactors and things like that, versus the high temperature spectroscopic uh, experiments where people measure with X-ray and can identify some of the species. And then the molecular level simulation, if we combine uh, all of these elements, we can kind of get a, a, a bigger picture of what's going on uh, in these different types of fluids. So it, it, needs, it needs a lot of more work, but for now we we'll just start to um, finalize integrating also the sulfate data, try to do a couple of models with the PhDs, and then the next step will be to start new experimental uh, work once we have um, built the apparatus this spring and uh, summer. So stay tuned. Great, thank you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for that, Alex. I've just got sort of one uh, sort of comment from Mark in the audience to say that uh, Misery Lake uh, is now called Crater Lake, uh, the Scandium rare earth element deposit. And it's still part of the graduate work from students at McGill under Willie's mentorship in conjunction with Imperial Mining Group. Oh, awesome. Crater Lake, I didn't know. I still have some, I still have some drill core. Uh, we, we tried to start working, but then we never really did it. So I use it in my literature chemistry class uh, that is happening actually right after this presentation. And oh. we can look at some thin section. So, so thanks for, for reminding me some updates, right? Because it's been nine years ago I've been in Canada. <laughs> I think that wraps up all the questions. And uh, at this point, I think that we can uh, end the discussion there. Alex, uh, I mean, once again, I thank you ever so much for the fantastic talk. I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I believe I speak for everyone in the audience as well. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks everyone for, for these questions. It's, it's so interesting and, and it's exciting that so many economic geologists uh, I, I excited about rare earths and I have so many interesting questions. So that that was great. Thanks so much. Fantastic. Thanks, Alex, and thanks to all of us. Brilliant. Okay, everyone, I'm going to end the meeting now. Once again, thank you for coming. Have a nice, uh, well, well, enjoy the rest of your day, evening, afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you once again. And Alex, thank you for giving a great talk. Take care, everybody. Cheers.